Good morning, San Francisco. Welcome to my talk on sustainability with rust. My name is Shane Miller and I am the leader of the rust open source team at AWS. I'm also chair of the Rust Foundation, a nonprofit organization that represents more than 30 com companies with a mission to support the rust technology and community. Today, I'm gonna to talk about the evolution of energy efficiency in the cloud and differences in energy efficiency across programming languages, particularly with a focus on Rust. I'll share some success stories of our Rust customers, and I am going to reveal the secret sauce that makes Rust unique. I'll tell you how you can get started using Rust today and then I'll talk a little bit about my outlook for the future of Rust. So worldwide, data centers today consume about 200 terawatt hours of energy each year. That's roughly 1% of all worldwide energy use. And if we look at the change over time on this graph, there's a couple of interesting things I wanna point out. The first is that the graph goes back to 2010, but the top of the graph is actually a flat line, right? It's relatively flat over that period of time. And what that tells us is that in spite of all of the changes that have happened over the last decade, energy consumption by our data centers has remained more or less constant. That's incredibly counterintuitive given what we know about the absolute explosion in big data, machine learning, and edge devices that has happened over the same period of time. But if we look inside the rectangle at the distribution between traditional cloud and hyperscale, we can see that that ratio, that distribution has changed dramatically over the same period of time. And it's that migration from traditional data centers to cloud and hyperscale that is keeping energy use in balance. It's because the, the cloud and hyperscale data centers have been investing substantially in energy efficiency improvements over that same period of time. That migration to the cloud is keeping energy use by worldwide data centers flat in spite of growth. Now we don't have time to go through all of the energy efficiency improvements cloud has been making, but I do want to cover a few examples to give you some idea what I'm talking about. In computation efficiency, we've made hardware improvements. We've actually made efficiency improvements in the processors themselves. And then we've, we've, we've made smarter utilization uh, features that manage that help us to reduce our idle time for our servers. That's been able to slow the growth of our servers with features like multi-instance and multi-tenant. We've improved our storage efficiencies with improvements to hardware improvements in drive density and efficiency. And then we've made improvements by reducing the data center power needs with energy efficiency improvements in our uh, building materials and in our cooling systems. So that's really good news. That's super cool, right? You came to a sustainability talk and I just told you, we've been man managing to keep energy use flat. But I have two questions that I'd like to pose. The first is whether or not it's good enough, right? Is the status quo okay? Is it okay for data centers worldwide to use 1% of our worldwide energy? And the second thing I want to pose is whether or not it's sustainable. Can we continue to innovate in energy efficiency in our infrastructure at the same rate our, our utilization is growing, right? At the same rate that our growth and our workloads is happening? I say probably not. Given what we know about this hockey stick that's happening in data consumption, data processing, and those big machine learning jobs that are doing the heavy training and inference work, inference work that are delivering 
the innovations that we are really excited about in our industry, I don't think it's a sustainable model. I don't think that we can continue to innovate on energy efficiency at the rate we're growing our workloads. So if we haven't figured it all out, what else can we do? Well, so far I've talked about cloud infrastructure efficiency improvements, but in the same model of security, sustainability is a shared responsibility. That is, AWS customers own responsibility for energy efficiencies in storage policies, in software design, and in compute utilization. And AWS owns the efficiencies that I've already been talking about, right? Efficiencies in hardware, in producing the uh, utilization levers for customers to be able to make the best choices, and in choosing the most energy efficient cooling systems. AWS is also investing in renewable energy. And in fact, we're on a path to be on 100% renewable energy by 2025. But renewables have an environmental impact as well. It will take half a million acres of solar panels to produce the 200 terawatt hours of energy our data centers consume today. The mining, manufacturing, and maintenance of that many solar panels has substantial environmental costs. So while we're really proud, and we are, we're really proud of the success we've had with renewable energy, as AWS Senior Vice President Peter DeSantis says, the greenest energy is the energy we don't use. Renewables should not replace energy efficiency as a design principle. In the same way that operational excellence, scalability, reliability are design principles of traditional software, traditional software design, sustainability must be, must be a principle of modern software design. So I want to go through some examples. What is Shane talking about when she says sustainability is a design principle? Well, we could relax our SLAs. Where we don't need optimized response times, let's relax SLAs for non-critical functions and instead optimize on resource use efficiency. We can allow for longer device upgrade cycles, right? We can leverage our virtualization and extend the, the life cycle of our laptops. We could use more caching. We could extend our TTLs. We could classify data and implement automated, automated lifecycle policies, right? Let's delete our data as soon as possible. And we could choose efficient algorithms for those repetitive processes like cryptography and compression. Last but not least, we can implement our software and energy efficient programming languages. So there was this really cool study a few years ago that was looking at the correlation between energy use, performance, and memory consumption. And this is a really common conversation in sustainability because what we wanna know is in the absence of a metric for energy use, if I don't have that information available, is something that I do know, is there a metric I already have that can act as a proxy for my energy use? That is, I'd like to be able to look at my dashboard where I have performance and I have my infrastructure use and look at those trends and infer something about the trends in my energy use. And so the study implemented 10 benchmark problems and 27 programming languages. And they measured execution time, energy consumption, and peak memory use. And here are the results. C and Rust significantly outperformed all other languages and energy efficiency. In fact, in this study, they were roughly 50% more energy efficient than Java and 98% more energy efficient than Python. Let's take a moment and absorb that. Okay, because it doesn't surprise anybody that C and Rust are more energy efficient than other languages. But what is a surprise is the magnitude of the difference. We could reduce 
the energy consumption of our compute, even by conservative estimates, by 50% with broad adoption of C and Rust. So, okay, why not C? Everybody knows a C programmer. Some of us know a thousand C programmers, right? This is a well-established language. It has been around for decades. There's a large developer community. The tools are well-worn. Well, Linus Torvald, the creator of Rust, said in his keynote at Open Source Summit last year that implementing code in C can be like juggling chainsaws. As a lifelong C programmer, Torvald knows that C's subtle type interactions are not always logical and are pitfalls for pretty much anybody. Rust delivers the energy efficiency of C without the risk of undefined behavior. Torvald called Rust the first language he's seen that might actually be a solution. We can cut energy use in half without losing the benefits of memory safety with broad adoption of Rust. In fact, several analyses have concluded that 70% of high severity CVEs that occur in C and C++ code would not be possible, would not even be possible if those same solutions had been implemented in Rust. That is table stakes. Rust combines the energy efficiency of C with the memory safety of languages like Java. The Internet Security Research Group, the foundation responsible for the Let's Encrypt project, the certificate authority for 260 million websites, feels so passionately about this that they have a project, an initiative, to migrate all of the Internet's security-sensitive infrastructure to memory-safe implementations. And if you go to memorysafety.org, you can see the project's underway right now. They include support for Rust in the Linux kernel and curl migrating to Rust implementations of TLS and HTTP. All right, let's go back to the study because I focused on the energy efficiency. But remember, that's not what the study was about. The study was looking at correlation, correlation between energy use, performance, and memory consumption. And this middle column is giving us the normalized execution time results. What we're seeing here is that Rust also is comparable in performance to C. That is when you choose to implement your solutions in Rust for sustainability and security, you also get the optimized performance of C. Tenable is a cybersecurity solutions provider focused on exposure visibility tools. And they had a sidecar agent that filtered out unnecessary metrics. The, uh, the, the solution was uh, written in JavaScript. It had been in production for several months and it was doing fine. But as the system started to scale, they saw performance degradation. So Tenable decided that they would have to rewrite this in a different language and they chose Rust for its performance and safety characteristics. This is the result, right? What we're looking at is median and P95 latency with the JavaScript and the Rust implementations. And you can see it's like roughly a 50% performance improvement, both at the median and at the P95. That's super cool. We love 50% performance improvements. But here are a couple other graphs from that same migration. Tenable also saw a 75% reduction in CPU usage and a 95, 95% reduction in memory use in production. Look at those graphs. I want my graphs to look like that, right? Um, these are substantial savings. And we're, you know, we're talking about dollars saved here, but this also translates into energy saved. These are the graphs of an energy efficient, sustainable and secure solution. At AWS, Rust has quickly become critical to building infrastructure at scale. Our first notable product, written in Rust, Firecracker, launched publicly in 2018. Firecracker is the open source virtualization technology that powers AWS Lambda and other serverless offerings. We use Rust to deliver services like Amazon S3, 
Amazon EC2, Amazon CloudFront, and many more. Last year, we launched Bottle Rocket, a Linux-based container operating system written in Rust. And our Amazon EC2 team uses Rust as their language of choice for AWS Nitro system components, including sensitive applications such as Nitro enclaves. At AWS, we believe leaders create more than they consume and they always leave things better than they found them. This is my new favorite leadership principle. I love this. And in 2019, AWS be, was proud to become a sponsor of the Rust project. In 2020, we started hiring Rust maintainers and contributors to work full-time. I started hiring them to work full-time, building out the Rust landscape. In 2021, AWS partnered with Google, Microsoft, Mozilla, and Huawei to create the Rust Foundation, a nonprofit organization with a mission to support the Rust technology and community. AWS is investing in the sustainability of Rust, a language I believe we should be using to build sustainable and secure solutions. All right, but the reality is very few engineers or corporations are choosing Rust for sustainability, right? They are adopting Rust for its unique value proposition, which is optimized safety, speed, and concurrency. Rust gives you the memory safety, optimized performance, and fearless concurrency. And developers are choosing, choosing Rust in a, a variety of domains. Right? I talked about some of the infrastructure services at AWS that are using Rust today. Amazon S3, Amazon EC2, Amazon CloudFront. Slash Data's Developer Nation survey found the most Rust developers in embedded solutions and augmented and virtual reality. And if you look at the more than 30 corporate members and contributors to the Rust Foundation, you will see a lot of different domains. You'll see other infrastructure providers in addition to AWS, Google, and Microsoft. You'll also see social, meta, hardware, ARM, security, Sentry, N1 password, automotive, Toyota, and video games, Activision. Rust is being adopted in a wide variety of domains. Discord was a mostly Python, Go, and Elixir shop, and they had a problem with one of their critical Go services. It had really bad tail latencies. Um, they, it, was a, it was a really simple service. It was just for storing and fetching small objects. They decided that they were gonna try to rewrite it in another language because Go is a garbage collection language, right? And the garbage collector, cleans up as objects are created and released. Every so often the garbage collector needs to make a pass and clean up those discarded objects. And it pauses, it pauses your process while it does that. And your process isn't able to respond to requests. And that's where you see this wait, right? This, these latency spikes, the pattern on the graph there. So Discord decided to try resolving this by rewriting their service in Rust. And here are the results. On the left, we have the Go implementation, and on the right, the Rust implementation. Now, at a glance, these don't look terribly different, right? We see that that uniform distribution of those spikes has gone away. But if we look more closely, they're actually in different units. The Rust version is more than 10 times faster overall, with the worst tail latencies being reduced 100 times. These are incredible gains, right? And when you're speeding up response times like that, your server is able to respond to a lot more requests. You need fewer servers, fewer servers, less energy. So again, Discord didn't come to Ross because they were thinking sustainability. They came for the ROI of uh, optimized safety, speed, and concurrency but the end result, the impact of their implementation, their adoption is a more sustainable solution. Now, again, I wanna come back to the fact that Rust is not the first efficient language, right? C has been around for a very long time. The difference here is that Rust is the first mainstream programming language that gives you that efficiency without 
sacrificing safety. You get to keep your memory safety. Uh, I said this early, I wanna come back to it again. 70% of the high severity security vulnerabilities that occur in C and C++ code are due to memory and safety, something that is prevented in Rust. Rust gives you that efficiency without feeling like you are playing with fire. A lot of other languages also give you that safety. They do it by implementing a garbage collector. The garbage collector automatically manages memory at runtime. It tracks the outstanding references to a piece of memory, and when all the references go out of scope, it does a pass and cleans things up. But the garbage collector is going to pause your application while it does that, and that's when you get those spikes in performance and latencies. Now, instead of a garbage collector, the innovation with Rust is safety is implemented through a combination of ownership and the borrow checker. Ownership is actually a really simple concept, right? But it has huge implications for the rest of the uh, language. It means that memory is owned by a single variable and there could be only one variable owner at a time. It could be passed around, but there could be only one. So let's look at an example of what, how that makes a difference in an implementation. In this example, we're looking at message passing with Go. On the left side, we create a gift, we assign it to a variable, and then we send it via the channel. Now on some other Go routine, I receive that gift and I can open it. If I forget that I have sent it, I can still open it. So the sender and the recipient are both opening the gift and that is where we get a bug. If we look at the same example in Rust, the gift is created and assigned on the left side. We say that the gift variable owns it, right? So this is, this is the vocabulary of ownership. Ownership of the gift is passed into the channel and the channel consumer receives the gift. Um, if the, the channel receiver is able to open it and if we forget, if we decide we're gonna open it after passing ownership, the compiler is going to yell at us. The compiler is going to yell at us. It's gonna stop us from being able to produce that program. So even though Go's garbage collector is managing the memory for us, we were able to write a bug in Go that's just not possible in Rust. We get excellent safety in Rust. Because Rust enforces the one variable at a time can own data, when that variable goes out of scope without passing ownership, then there is no way to access that data anymore. So Rust automatically frees the memory at that point, and there's no need for the developer, the Rust developer, to manually free the memory. Rust ownership system is part of a type system based on a concept called affine types. An affine type imposes a rule that every variable is used at most once. The key is to, to define what used means. In the context of Rust, a used means either moving the data or dropping it. By using affine types, the Rust compiler is able to reason about a program and enforce these rules at compile time. Now, this affine type system is based on work done in the early 90s by a group trying to implement a garbage collector less lisp. They were trying to implement a version of Lisp that had no garbage collector, and they were successful, they got it done. But because they couldn't have multiple references to the same piece of data, they had tremendous performance degradation, right? Because in the absence of being able to pass around that data or being able to have multiple references to that data, they had to pass it around and that meant copy the data and all those copies added up to performance, and per performance degradation. That gets us to the second innovation of Rust, which is the borrow checker. Okay, when writing programs, we use these abstractions. I think probably most of you are familiar with the function, right? So we wanna put, put a logical piece of code into a small group that we're gonna call a function. But typically, we are gonna need some input to that function. We're gonna need to pass data to the function and then we're gonna want the function to pass it back to us. And that passing is if we're passing ownership, that is copying the data. And so that passing of 
uh, data to the function and then having the data passing back, passing that ownership is where we're getting the performance degradation. That is the degradation that the garbage collector lisp, lisp was experiencing. In Rust, we solve this by letting you borrow data without taking ownership. So the memory stays where it is and a pointer is passed around. The pointer is guaranteed to be valid by the compiler. Okay, so I have a gift. We're gonna go back to this gift example. I have a gift, I own it, it's mine. If my friend wants to admire it, she can borrow it. And while my friend is admiring my gift, here in my, my function admire, while she's admiring it, no one else can have it. I cannot give it to anybody else. I cannot pass ownership because it is being borrowed. The Rust compiler enforces these rules and because they are enforced and guaranteed with the borrowing data, the memory doesn't have to be copied. And when you put it all together, you have a language that is both efficient and safe. All right, so I said the, uh, the, the, the magic combination, the ROI for Rust was optimized safety, speed, and concurrency. So let's talk about concurrency. In Rust, we say we have fearless concurrency because the same system that prevents memory unsafety can also prevent data races. A data race is a category of bug that happens in concurrency when you have two or more threads that are accessing the same piece of data and one of them is doing a mutation, right? The same type system that models ownership and borrow checking is able to uphold that guarantee across multiple threads. That gives us the ability to more aggressively use concurrency in Rust because there's a whole category of bugs that's just not possible. I wanna show you too how easy it is to safely use concurrency in Rust. So here we have a, a function implemented both synchronously and concurrently. And what I want you to observe is how very similar these are. The, the function is sum even, right? It's going to um, iterate over an array of uh, values and then sum the even numbers. This is a highly parallelizable operation. Um, and we can imagine that for a very large array, being able to do this concurrently would have substantial performance improvements. So the left side is the single threaded version and the right side is showing you the parallel version using the Rayon library. And what I want you to see is how similar these functions are. You get all of the concurrency without the hazards by basically writing the same function in Rust. The, um, the parallel version will spread the computation across many threads, all while avoiding copying the array of numbers being passed around as the argument. And Rayon is able to provide this API safely due to Rust's characteristics of ownership and the borrow checker. All these systems guarantee safety at compile time. All right, so to review, the ingredients in Rust secret sauce. Remember I promised you I was gonna tell you the secret sauce are the ownership model, which prevents multiple references to the same data, enabling fearless concurrency and reducing bugs with memory safety. The borrow checker, which eliminates the need to copy data in order to reference it and keeps the performance clean without compromising our ownership. And then all of this is checked at compile time preventing developers from producing a program that violates these rules. So the secret sauce of the programming language delivers an unmatched combination of optimized safety, speed, and performance, or excuse me, and, and concurrency. And that's the mag magic that makes Rust unique. The combination of attributes that are driving developers, software leaders, and companies to adopt Rust. Okay, so hopefully by now, you're super excited, you're ready to begin your sustainability journey in the cloud. How do I get started with Rust today? Well, it's really easy, actually. All the resources you need are available online. The um, Rust book is an excellent resource. I have read it, I, I strongly recommend it. It gives you what you need to get the Rust toolkit installed 
There are excellent exercises that give you an introduction to the language. You can do the exercises, read the code samples. Um, you can also, I like, to, I like to read documentation. Um, you can also browse the crate documentation for the more than 80,000 crates that have been built by the Rust community. And then if you have questions, if you get stuck, um, or if you just wanna chat about something and, and figure out, try to understand it better, you can post on the REST user forum, forum or you can have a real-time conversation with the community um, on the community Discord server. And once you're like, you've mastered that and you're feeling pretty confident, you can move to inter intermediate level stuff. Uh, the Crust of Rust is a great YouTube channel that is uh, produced by an AWS engineer named John Jingsted. Um, and he does these fantastic deep dives where he goes to a specific uh, a, a specific part of Rust and he pops the hood and he really dives deep. I will warn you, these videos are multiple hours long and I have heard that one of his more recent live coding exercises went on for eight hours. Um, so some of them are extensive, but if you are interested in really digging into a subject, everybody has said great things about John's videos. He also recently published a book that is intermediate level Rust programming called Rust for Rustations. Okay, so at the beginning of this talk, I said, well, you weren't all here, but at the beginning of this talk, I said, good morning, San Francisco. My name is Shane Miller, and I am the leader of the Rust open source team at AWS and the chair of the Rust Foundation. And those are definitely my titles, but they're a bit squishy and they don't describe well what I do. And before I dive into my outlook for the future, I wanna talk more about the perspective that I have because I think that context will help in understanding how I'm thinking about the future of Rust. So my Rust open source team at AWS is composed of authors, leaders, and maintainers from strategically important parts of the Rust landscape. That's everything from the compiler to HTTP. And these leaders are leading teams of maintainers in the landscape that are sometimes as small as three engineers and sometimes as big as 14 engineers. And those groups of maintainers are leading bigger groups of contributors in building the Rust landscape. And that lands, those, those contributors, they number in the thousands, okay? So when I am thinking about these things, at this scale, I'm no longer talking about building a team. I'm talking about building a technology nation. We need, for nation building, some key ingredients. We need a common goal. We need a common culture. And we need a common platform for collaborating and calibrating. Okay, so to get there, let's go back to the beginning. How did we get here? Rust started in 2006 as a personal project of Graydon Hoare. Now, Graydon lived on the 21st floor of an apartment building, and elevator firmware crashes kept leaving his elevator out of order, and he had to climb those 21 floors on foot. And as he climbed, he reflected on his job at Mozilla, where he was a C++ engineer, and he was spending so much of his capacity battling those sharp edges of C++ battling that memory safety. And he knew that was the root cause of his broken elevator. In frustration, Graydon embarked on a personal project, a personal mission to build a programming language that was safe, fast, and concurrent, right? He wanted to solve this problem. He worked by himself nights and weekends for four years. And in 2010, Graydon persuaded his employer, Mozilla, to invest in his Rust project. In 2015, almost a decade in the making, Rust 1.0 was launched. Now, today, there are over 1 million Rust developers. The Rust developer community was the fastest growing in the last two years, coming from 400,000 developers in the third quarter of 2019 to 1.1 million, almost tripling in two years in the third quarter of 2021. And that is amazing growth. But as you can see from this graph, Rust is still a relatively small developer community. 
And I've just pers persuaded all of you that Rust is the perfect programming language. So why isn't everybody using Rust? What's going on? Let's look at that. As I said, Rust provides a combination of the performance and efficiency of C with the memory safety of languages like Java. And we captured this in the community with sayings like, have your cake and eat it too, or performance, reliability, productivity, pick three. Rust promises to deliver on a lot of dimensions. Let's, let's look at that last one again. Performance, reliability, productivity, pick three. I want to audit that. Performance. We talked, we looked at the study results, right, that showed that Rust and C were comparable in terms of performance and they were they're, they were executing faster than all the other languages. We also talked about customer stories where we'd seen massive performance improvements over JavaScript and Go. I think we could say that Rust delivers safe, I think we could safely say Rust delivers on performance. Reliability, we talked about the fact that 70% of the high severity CVEs that occur in C and C++ code are not possible in Rust. We've talked about the fact that you can, there's fearless concurrency right? You have that ownership guarantee across threads in Rust. And we talked about the fact that you have no garbage collector, you have no pauses, and so you get consistent performance even in the long tail. So I think we nailed reliability. I'm feeling really good about that one. The last one is productivity. Now productivity here is referring to developer productivity. We have not talked about that yet, so let's dig into that a little bit. Of the more than 8,000 developers, who responded to the 2020 Rust user survey, only about 100 of them identified as expert. And of the engineers who said they were no longer using Rust, 55% cited learning and productivity as their reason for abandoning the language. It takes experienced engineers, and I mean experienced engineers, somebody with 10 years experience who's really solid developer, it takes, it takes those experienced engineers three to six months of study with access to a subject matter expert, like the people on my team, before they can be productive with Rust. Some of the developers have likened it to learning to eat your vegetables. And while many of them love it once they get productive, in fact, it's been the number one most loved language on the um, Slack overflow survey for six years in a row. Um, in spite of the fact that most of them love it once they get productive with it, a lot of engineers are deciding not to learn Rust or they are abandoning the effort before they are productive with it. The sustainability and safety, security that I've been talking about will only materialize if we turn this broccoli into a brownie because no one developer service or corporation can have a substantial impact on sustainability, right? We, it's like recycling. We all have to do our part for it to actually have that kind of impact. But to get there, we need to, we need to do some work on the developer experience. But which developer experience, right? Not all developer experiences are exactly the same. The Linux kernel engineer's ideal developer experience is different than a database service builder's ideal experience, which is different than somebody who's building a retail website. And we can't lose sight of the fact that Rust is a purpose-built language. Now, I don't mean that it's a domain-specific language. Some people kind of <laughs> react when I say purpose-built language, but I do mean that there's a hero use case that Rust was purpose-built for. Its purpose is to solve Graydon's elevator. It's the unique combination of optimized safety, speed, and concurrency. Rust is also the best programming language for a lot of other kinds of domains, video games, diagnostic and monitoring tools, databases, search engines, cryptographic libraries. There are plenty of opportunities though to improve the Rust developer experience. How do we do that? How do we make Rust accessible and productive for more permutations of personas and principles? because Rust is never going to be a dynamic language. We don't want it to be. The core language has to stay used, stay true to its hero use case and performance and, and persona. Rust is purpose built for optimized secure safety, speed, 
and concurrency. That's going to mean more friction up front, and it means fewer bugs and safer refactoring. But we can make it more accessible to more personas with purpose-built abstractions. Purpose-built abstractions are whole product solutions for specific personas. Tokyo is a great example of this. Tokyo is everything you need to build a reliable network application without compromising speed. And solutions like Tokyo deliver whole product experiences for specific use cases, dramatically simplifying the developer experience for target personas. As the Rust community grows, there are more of these whole product solutions for specific domains being added to the landscape, to the toolbox available to all Rust developers. Bevy is another example. Bevy is a game engine for Rust. And Rust Wasm is enabling products like Amazon Prime Video to deliver content to millions of customers on more than 8,000 device types while improving performance. So I said 8,000 and then I said device types and probably you heard devices because otherwise you all would have gone, woo. Uh, so let me try it again. <laughs> Rust Wasm is enabling Prime Video to deliver content to millions of customers on more than 8,000 device types. Thank you. <laughs> while improving performance. This is wild, right? This is just amazing stuff. And the Rust Foundation is the organization that is making a lot of this possible. The Rust Foundation covers things like infrastructure costs, and that means the actual storage costs of those 80,000 plus crates that the Rust community has been building. It also means on-call support, right? Providing an on-call team that can do the operational uh, ne necessary things to keep that infrastructure up and running. We cover things like product tool, productivity tool licenses for maintainers, right? So small things, but also things like the Rust annual user survey, the Rust annual conference, user conference. We provide developer cloud desktops to maintainers so that we can make being a maintainer accessible to more people by giving them access to powerful com compute resources. Most recently, we launched the community grants program I'm very excited about this, and so you're gonna to have to bear with me while I do a plug for the Community Grants Program. The Community Grants Program has four different kinds of grants. Fellows receive a monthly stipend of $1,000. They also get a travel allowance for attending events and conferences, and they get access to training to improve themselves and grow themselves. Project also provides uh, specific grants up to $20,000 for bodies of work that are proposed by members of the community. And we're um, providing grants for people to both attend or host events for the Rust community. And finally, hardship grants provide access to uh, fast funds for members of the community who are experiencing food or shelter insecurity. So I said a technology nation needs a common goal, common culture, and a common platform for collaboration and calibration. The Rust Nation's goal is sustainable and secure software. Our culture is open, inclusive, and extendable. And the platform for collaboration is the Rust Foundation. The moral of the story, Rust is an amazing technology to secure and sustain our future, our industry. You can start using Rust and make a difference today. Rust is purpose-built for optimized safety, speed, and concurrency. And the Rust Foundation is the platform that is creating space for people across our industry to effectively collaborate on Rust. So this kind of thing interest you, please get involved. We would love to have you contribute. It's open source and it needs people to build it. Join our Rust Nation. Let's build technology and community that outlast us all. Thank you for your time today. I really hope I gave you something valuable. This was fantastic for me. Um, you 
I, I would encourage you to get engaged with AWS training the skill builders and the certifications. I'll pause there for a second. And then if you do have a moment, uh, please fill out the uh, session survey. Thank you so much. Thank you.